some moron, and I will use the word moron, thought about that the defense of the East lies in the West. And 95% of the army was, and the Air Force and the Navy was in West Pakistan and only 5% was in East Pakistan. And they felt East Pakistan was indefensible. Now, if you consider a part of your country, which, is a, which by population is the larger part of your population, that they are indefensible and you can only uh, uh, protect them by protecting the Western side, I think that was a moronic concept. I joined the army in May 1964 when I entered the Pakistan Military Academy and I graduated from the Pakistan Military Academy in uh, October 1965, just after the war. Well, actually, I reached East Pakistan first on temporary posting when I was not I'm basically an infantry officer, but I was uh, on deputation with the army aviation. And in fact, I was flying fixed wing aircraft and helicopters. And I was deputed uh, to log flight Eastern Command. Uh, which is the uh, which had two uh, elevate three helicopters, smaller ones, and two Mi-8, and I was uh, attached with uh, the commander Eastern Command, which at that time was Lieutenant General Sabda Yaqub. Now I actually went there when the cyclone took place on Friday, 13th November, and soon after that, you know, we were sent to East Pakistan to help with cyclone relief. And when I reached East Pakistan at that time, of course, there was a big human tragedy for the cyclone about many millions of people perished in that cyclone and we were actually a contingent of aircraft which is flying relief uh, to the cyclone hit areas but uh, uh, then after my temporary posting finished i was sent back to uh, west pakistan in uh, march 1971 just bef just when the uh, problems had started but the problem became worse and i was post now i was posted this time on permanent posting to uh, log flight Eastern Command, Logistic Flight Eastern Command, and which I reached on soon after the crackdown, army crackdown on 27. In the period that I uh, was there between 1st and uh, uh, 12th March uh, 1971, the situation was uh, getting from bad to worse. The army was uh, con confined only to the cantonments and there were complete civil disobedience uh, there were no, um, none of this, um, the civil affairs uh, administration was working, right? Even the police was not listening to anything uh, from the, um, from the uh, central government. So the only authority of the central government was existing in the cantonments at that time. India always had something to do with problems in East Pakistan. There's no doubt about it. But at that point of time, it was a clear uh, insurrection, you know, because the army crackdown had taken place on 25th March. And by 27th March, the entire country was, um, um, you know, in, um, in sort of a state of revolt uh, at that point of time. And uh, at that point in time, there was, we could not see any Indian influence. Later on, within days thereafter, you know, when I was uh, with the East Bengal Regiment later, and then I, of course, saw Indian influence at first. And not Indian influence, Indian presence uh, coming in. I think the first um, re reason was political. And it started with uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the, it started with the language movement. When uh, Urdu was declared as a state language, even, even though the Bangladeshis, now Bangla Bengalis at that time, were in a majority. And obviously they did not accept it. And uh, they, uh, in fact, uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and all who led that movement, uh, he were, they were actually Muslim League. They were Muslim League activists. And they broke away and made the Awami Muslim League. Right? And then later on, they dropped the Muslim from it and became Awami League. So basically, 
started with the language movement. This became a problem uh, after 1952, when on 21st February, uh, the medical college students were fired upon and many were killed. And th that became a rallying point for them uh, as far as the language is concerned. And thereafter, of course, there were a lot of other reasons which they felt that uh, they were, uh, there were disparity, uh, they think they were earning uh, money because of jute goods and they were not getting enough uh, development funds in lieu, etc. So there are a myriad number of reasons they had. Not at all. I think this was a, a split that happened, but there were many reasons for it. Number one was the fact that, uh, you know, just consider the disparity, that uh, it was considered some moron, and I will use the word moron, thought about that the defense of the East lies in the West. And 95% of the Army was, and the Air Force and the Navy was in West Pakistan and only 5% was in East Pakistan. And they felt that East Pakistan was indefensible. Now, if you consider part of your country, which, is the, which by population is the larger part of your population, that they are indefensible and you can only uh, uh, protect them by protecting the Western side, I think th that was a moronic concept. And I think that was the start of everything bad. And thereafter, of course, there was disparity. There was disparity in everything, whether it, uh, whether this thing is said. And I don't think anybody contests that, that there was disparity. The fact of the matter remains, there was a lot of love and affection between East and West Pakistan. And frankly speaking, the way it deteriorated in 1970, end of 1917, actually in 1971, was even beyond my, um, you know, uh, let us say imagination even, the, the, the sharp decline of that uh, relationship. I, I think many reasons. I think a lot of people made uh, a lot of mistakes. And I think the biggest mistake was made was then when, uh, uh, you know, that the election should not have been held in uh, November and December. It should not have been held because of the cyclone. The cyclone was devastating. And because the cyclone was devastating, a lot of helicopters and relief came in from other countries. So we were only four helicopters from Pakistan Army. And uh, there were about 30 helicopters, 35 from other countries. USA, Russia, China, you know, uh, not China, France, uh, UK. The Army at that time did play a very big role in, uh, you know, in uh, this thing. But the perception was different. And because the perception was different, uh, a lot of uh, people, um, people who were mature people, uh, suggested to the federal government that do not hold the election now, let the feeling subside, let it uh, calm down. And this is not the right time, they did not. And at that point, Awami League then won a sweeping majority and completely uh, the thing. Once they had won the sweeping majority, democracy demanded that they be given the power, right? And at that point of time, even uh, the president of the country at one time said, you know, called Sheikh Mujib as the prime minister of the country. But then there were reasons. They were within East Pakistan, within the Bami League. They were secessionists. There's no doubt about it. But I think by and large, it, it, they thought that with greater autonomy, uh, the country could stay together. But I think then, of course, in March, when the assembly was dissolved, uh, not dissolved, the assembly was postponed. When the it was postponed, they then uh, things deteriorated. There were total uh, civil disobedience, and the administration were taken over. And because of that, at the end of the day, the army had to restore law and order, to restore the authority of the central government. They had to crack down. And when that crackdown took place, it took place with a lot of bloodshed. And because of the bloodshed, after that there was no question. It was just a question of time before East Pakistan became Bangladesh. Soon after the crackdown took place, they collected all the foreign correspondents and sent them out of Pakistan, right? Send them to Karachi and all. All these people came back through Calcutta, right? And then they started spreading all these. They only took the news that India was giving them, right? So you had a complete blackout. In West Pakistan, even you could not, uh, there was no idea of what was going on in East Pakistan. No, 
when a crackdown takes place, when you're trying to restore the authority of the central government, people did get killed, right? But at the same time, uh, you know, from the other side, there were a lot of killing of, of, of uh, Biharis, non-Bengalis, etc. in isolated places. And it was bru brutal. I have witnessed to it. I'm a witness to it. From March 1st to March 12th, as a helicopter pilot, I was visiting places. And I was, I was seeing it was, it was brutal. How the three million figure came up? When Sheikh Mujibur Rahman came to Dhaka, because he was incarcerated, he went to London, he came back to Dhaka. In the aircraft, he, uh, he uh, asked uh, Kamaru Zaman, uh, who was the, you know, uh, one of the leaders of Awami League, who came up to see him and to brief him, that how many people died? So he said, teen lakho, which means three lakhs, right? So when, when Sheikh Mujib came up, soon after that, he said three million, uh, lakho. You know, so once he had said this lakho, it became a, a this thing. Now, you know, many times there is, uh, there have been atrocities there. There's no question about it. And those atrocities should not have taken place. But those atrocities are not from the regular army. The regular army made a mistake of getting a lot of police people, a lot of uh, uh, civil armed forces people, and mostly they made uh, Razakars, which they called Shams and Badr. They committed a lot of atrocities, right? Even the uh, killing of the intellectuals, uh, which in Dhaka jail in, in the month of December was done by these people, not by the regular army. And in fact, uh, just to give an example, that there was a war commission, which they made. And in the war commission, they asked the people who have lost their lives or missing, they should ask for compensation, only 2,000 asked for compensation, right? We, obviously, they're much more they're killed. I estimate uh, that almost uh, maybe uh, between uh, 100 to 150,000 uh, Bangladeshis were killed and maybe about 75 to 100,000 uh, non-Bengalis, including Biharis, Punjabis, Patans, and isolated places they were killed. Look, first of all, you must remember that there were not divisions with full complements. There were three and a half divisions, lightly armed troops. They did not have their full complement. Every division has an armor regiment. Every division has an artillery regiment. Every division has an engineer regiment. Now, all these divisions went from here. They were lightly equipped. They could not carry the. Oh, there was only one, uh, let us say, one division there pre Nam March. That is uh, 14 division and 14 division had four brigades, right? And in those four brigades, there were five Bengali battalions which were not used, Bengal regiment battalions. So if you take four brigades and every brigade has got three battalions, so that is say 12 battalions, then you take five battalions out of that, that means only seven battalions, right? Now when the, uh, the units which went from here, which was 16 div and 9 div, they were not fully uh, with their full complement. And then they had civil armed forces, etc., etc. So, ad hoc basis, they made three and a half divisions. They were including these civil armed forces and police, there were only 35,000 people under arms. The 93,000 figure came up because of their families and other civilian administrators, etc., who were from, who are West Pakistanis. And they were also taken into custody. So, in Indian prisoners of war camp, there were only 35,000 people who were, uh, say, with, uh, 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 were wearing uniform, and the rest of them were uh, not wearing uh, uniform. Look, uh, I was uh, among the first uh, prisoner of war in India, and that was during a time that India did not declare their prisoner of war. We were the East Bengal Regiment, we were taken prisoners wherever we were. Some of the officers were killed. Um, mostly they were taken into custody and handed over to India, right? And Indians then made a prisoner of war camp on 25, 25th April 1971, which is far, uh, the war had not yet been declared. And this, this prisoner of war was not declared under the Geneva Convention to anybody. The people that we were held there, ultimately 32 officers and 2,000 other ranks, it was not declared, it was a place called Panagar, 
they were not declared so uh, they were present of course some of them were also bengali officers there bengali officers were not trusted uh, by the indians and ultimately some of them were cleared and um, some of them went back to uh, the mukti bahini that was created the mukti bahini was actually you know uh, there is a misnomer here everybody says mukti bahini started on 25th of uh, uh, march no this is wrong mukti bahini actually started on 7th of april actually officially right and there were uh, people who joined up uh, there were police people there was civil army east pakistan rifle people who joined up with the regular army east bengal regiments east bengal regiment the only uh, regiment that actually revolted that actually revolted was 8 east bengal in chittagong which was you know commanded killed the commanding officer and zia rahman the two ic took over and that is the only battalion the rest of the battalion did not revolt they were only uh, the only they were away four bengal was away uh, third bengal they tried to disarm third bengal third bengal fought back first bengal fought back on 29th of march right uh, uh, and the, uh, so it is it, it's a long story and uh, let us just say that uh, we all planned to escape but uh, circumstances made it so that i was the only one who escaped right and of course um, you know we had made plans out um, one of the officers who was there who was a ssg officer major sadik nawaz he made the plans out he briefed us thoroughly etc in the end uh, you know i was in, in solitary confinement and i decided that i could not hang on in but so after 199 days of custody i escaped on the 100 day i was the first prisoner of war in history uh, to escape uh, from india in, in either war 65 or 71 so i was the first one but uh, you know the fact of the matter remains that it's a long story it's, um, none of my plans worked right or all the plans that i made were i had to keep on changing the plans and i i, I can only thank god uh, that i managed to come out of india alive and uh, you know and i'm sitting in front of you 50 years later almost to the day right but uh, is and uh, one can say now was a very brave and very crazy no it's not that you know uh, courage is nothing else but the control of fear right and i just want i did not think it uh, it right to be sitting in a, in a prisoner of war camp etc so uh, i did escape right and of course uh, you know the fact of the matter is that my mother was bengali and i have feelings the same feelings that i have in 1971 that uh, you know the crackdown the way it was done should not have taken place right because the people were killed uh, uh, unarmed people were killed which was not correct but then unarmed people were killed uh, from this side also so i think that was a part of her. i think it all started with the fact that uh, kissinger was given that opening to china in july and uh, because of that uh, uh, united states were very grateful to pakistan but i don't think that and then because of that uh, the then president nixon was leaning towards uh, pakistan and he did not like in the indira gandhi at all so he also instructed kissinger the secretary of state but kissinger of course was more of a realist and he realized that whatever happens east pakistan is untenable uh, you know in that sense with you know when you know that general manik shaw himself said that at one time we had a we had a ratio of 10 to 1 right uh, over this thing now look uh, i do not uh, for one second um, um, you know uh, accept the crackdown it was necessary to restore the central authority but once you had done the crackdown the way you did uh, the, there was no question of east and west pakistan staying together but on the other hand Uh, the army uh, the myth that is said uh, you know is wrong there was not only one battalion and i'm not going to name the battalion but one battalion had quarter element of that battalion surrendered uh, near kumela and and, and near Ch- rather chandpur that surrendered and out of the 30 out of the, all the other battalions of the pakistan army that was fighting the units of the pakistan army the air force and they were fighting nobody surrendered till 16 december came along and even after 16 december they had a lot of difficulty in convincing people to lay down their arms and not only that let me tell you that i am very proud of the fact that my own unit four army aviation squadron 
it came out leaving only one damaged helicopter. The surrender took place at 9 o'clock in the morning and they flew out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, right from the center of uh, uh, the Dhaka cantonment. And they brought an entire load, an entire nursing nurses of Pakistan out with them, right? So they, you know, flew and they flew first north towards India side, then west towards India side, as east towards India side, and then south towards Burma. And then they came over Burma and then they threw their weapons into the sea and then they came and landed in, in Burma. So they were people and then Air Force pilots, they were put in a plane, they escaped from there. They did not uh, surrender, right? And I think, uh, you know, in the sense that uh, none of the units had surrendered. I think if you look at it, and I don't want to go into the military planning, uh, the army as it is uh, fought very well. And that is something that has been acknowledged. It is just that this, the higher command, you know, uh, uh, they had not catered for the thing. There was certainly superior generalship from the other side. And why not? If you have a 10 to 1 uh, ratio, then you have a superior generalship. Actually, um, I escaped on 16 July. Uh, 1971, uh, which was 99 days in custody, and on 17 July, I, you know, the Indians were expecting that I would go westwards because we were on the Bihar Bengal border, a place called Panagar, only 16 miles away uh, from their border, and they were Urdu speaking Bihar, Bihar is Urdu, and they expected me to go towards Bihar side, and uh, this is what uh, we had told our other prisoner of war also. I told them they are going to Bihar, side. but I went the other side. I went east towards Calcutta, which they don't expect. And I gained some time because of that. And once I was inside Calcutta, of course, there was curfew in Calcutta at night. And uh, the long story, I broke into the American Consulate General there. And uh, they did not know what to do with me because at that point of time, a lot of people do not know that we were allied with the Americans in Centro, Central Treaty Organization and CATO, Southeast Treaty Organization. And I said, I'm an allied officer, right? So. Obviously, uh, they helped me and they did not help me. And they said that we can, you know, cannot because of various reasons. But by that time, I had cuts on my body, which were, you know, I was badly in, in set. They were injured. I needed clothes, I was given clothes, right? I got a little money, right? And in fact, they offered that they would somehow get me out. Um, you know, this thing. I said, no, I'll go on my own. So I made my way on. When I came out in Calcutta, I found that they had my uh, my photographs all over the place as a Naxal chief, not as a Pakistani, as a Naxal, a Naxalite. You know, there was a Naxalite construction going on and there was a reward on my head as a Naxal chief. And so I, uh, you know, I had no other choice, but I, I, the railway stations were being covered, the bus stations were being covered. So I went to the airport and got myself a ticket to Delhi. But long and short that I had a lot of help from places. At a certain place, of course, uh, the, the SSG intelligence uh, people were sent in, uh, who escorted me uh, with uh, with weapons. With uh, weapons, we went out to Nepal. For Nepal, we went to Burma, uh, and under uh, a different passports, and then from Burma to Thailand, and then back then to East Pakistan. Because by by uh, 17th August, I was back in East Pakistan, and uh, then of course I went through the normal interrogation period. And, and, and of course, my views were not very correct, according to the, at that point of time, the feeling of what was happening there. So I went on to extend an interrogation. And then I was posted to West Pakistan on 12th of November. And uh, I fought the war again in a new unit called 44 Punjab, 4 Sin, which is my unit. And uh, on 3rd December, I started war again. And in fact, uh, today is uh, the 10th of December. On 13th of December, 50 years ago, I got a battlefield promotion to the rank of major in Chor. And my company, my rifle company, uh, was renamed as Sagal Company. And today, Forsin, which is the battalion now Forsin, Four still has Sagal Company and still has uh, me as a battlefield promotion. I think the first thing to understand is that is that people love each other. It's only 
academics and all, and, and propaganda that has been fed. Somebody asked me once, I went with General Musharraf to, uh, General Musharraf took me deliberately when he went to visit Delhi, you know, and of course, he was the one that got away, you know, he sort of this thing said. And uh, uh, people, uh, you know, uh, uh, and um, uh, one of their famous anchors, uh, Sardisi, uh, he asked me, will, and Kuldeep Nair was there, and there was this Jane Dixit, they were there in the same this thing. They asked me, they said, oh, the Bengalis hate you, this and that. I told them, okay, sir, what I'll do is next time there's a cricket match in Dhaka, I will pay for your tickets to the cricket match, right? And we'll see who. Who hates who, right? You do know that they do not allow in Bangladesh even today flags inside the stadium. And do you know why? Because mostly Pakistan flags come out in the stadium. Right now, you can believe the Indian propaganda, which is true, is that in the big cities, there's a lot of animosity, the history books say differently, etc. But I am 100% sure that there will be rapprochement between Bangladesh and Pakistan. When Bangladesh and Pakistan must recognize they are independent, each other, as they still need each other, complementary economies, right? And it is only good can come of it. There is no question of, uh, of you know, having, making a union against India or somebody else. That's not a, uh, a reason for a reason for relationship between two peoples is love and affection between the two people. And that, that is there. And there is a need for each other. I've been to Bangladesh with, uh, at that time, Prime Minister Mia Nawaz Sharif. And it continued during that time, even, you know, uh, the relationship, right? When, uh, the, when we actually visited uh, 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 Dhaka Stadium and India was playing Pakistan, and the crowd was cheering Pakistan. And when they found the Pakistan Prime Minister in the VIP hall, when we came late after Friday prayers, and they went and cheered me and Nawaz Sharif. And I was, I'm eyewitness to it. I'm not somebody that didn't see that. And when we, by the way, when we crossed the girls' pavilion, because the old stadium that had a route from the back, and we had to go around the girls' stadium, and they turned around, they had all crescent and star on their cheeks. And me and Nawaz Sharif was stunned for some time. And, you know, he just stood there and looked at what's happening here. You know, so look. Uh, there is bad feeling because that feeling, bad feeling has been fostered by propaganda, right? But let us say, why didn't Mr. Modi get a tr tremendous welcome in, in Dhaka when he went there on 25th of March this year, on the 50th of uh, this thing and when he declared that this thing, why didn't, what type of, he could not really, really, he was met with a lot of protests. He had to be helicoptered in from the airport to where we had to go, right? So. What you see and read in the newspaper or on the social media, don't believe it. Believe what you can see with your own eyes. And I can tell you that this relationship will become what it was, it once was, once both of the countries realize they're independent. Now, I just give you one figure. Pakistan Army, and you remember you said something about three divisions. They were fighting an enemy. Why does Bangladesh need 10 divisions now? They've got 10 divisions today, right? And they've got two armored brigades, which is three times, more than three times the strength of the Pakistan army when you're fighting. Why do they need 10 divisions today, right? Please answer me this question.